Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us in another edition of State of Sound Stories. In case this is your first time tuning in, State of Sound Stories is a library's event in which we ask individuals and groups to share their creative paths that got them involved with sound. And for more information about State of Sound or the larger project of State of Sound in general, you can visit lib.ncsu.edu backslash state of sound, and it'll be in the Twitch chat as well. There's going to be a designated time to ask questions at the end, but feel free to ask any and all questions during the interview. Just throw them in the chat and we'll get to them right away. Right away. And without further ado, welcome David Go, aka DJ Paradigm. How are you doing today? Good, man. Good. I'm, I feel uh, real thankful and blessed to be here, man. It's a beautiful day in North Carolina. Thank today you. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for being here. We really appreciate having you. And it is a beautiful day. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in as well. This is a long time coming. Actually, we booked you for a workshop right when the pandemic hit and a lot of people were excited about it. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that, but I'm really glad that we're able to catch up now. And to give the audience a little bit of a context, you have quite the resume. You've been DJing for decades. You've done huge events around the local area like CIAA, New Year's parties, All-Star Weekend. You're an affiliate of Dreamville. You're an entrepreneur. You have a YouTube page. You're a turntablist to the core. Um, so let's go ahead and get started all the way from the beginning. Where, where did your music influence come from? What was playing in the house? Did you have siblings who would show you music, your friends? Um, where did it all start? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm the youngest of four, uh, but really my influence came from my sister um, as far as getting into music. So my sister's 10 years older than me. Uh, I would have to say I was the accident of the family. <laughs> so my sister's 10 years older than me. Um, and of course, you know, when I was eight, she was 18. So, you know, she was 80s baby. Uh, and just really engulfed into R&B and pop music uh, and just, you know, 80s culture, especially coming from Cambodia. Uh, my family really didn't know too much about, you know, American culture. So everything that we learned was really off of TV and the radio. So, you know, my sister was a huge Prince fan, a huge R&B fan. Um, <laughs> So it was just something that uh, I kind of got through her. And then also my dad would collect records. So my dad was actually, oh, sorry about that. He collected, um, you know, records here and there. Uh, most of the time, if a lot of, you know, uh, blues artists or jazz artists didn't make it in America, they would go overseas and, you know, get their vinyl printed in Japan or, you know, basically like that so you know I got a couple records from my dad but you know a lot of the influence came from my sister uh really just being engulfed in you know buying vinyl buying seat uh not really cds but tapes um and just listening to music so you know I, I get a lot of inspiration and and a lot of my roots from my sister so but that's kind of how I got my start um, and then when I was a senior in high school, I met a, a kid, another guy that was in my class. And at the time I was doing like graffiti. I wasn't really good at it. I would try to break dance. I wasn't good at that either. But, you know, he was a DJ, but he was DJing like drum and bass music. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's cool. I don't know nothing about it, but I'll come over to your house and, you know, uh, we'll hang out. Um, and then I just kind of fell in love with DJing. So, you know, and I bought my first turntables. Well, I had one turntable and then <laughs> a Radio Shack mixer. Um, and then I just started from there. And of course, you know, my love for DJing kept me, man, it, it kept me out of a lot of trouble. I was in the house, you know, of course, practicing. So I got real lucky, you know, uh, staying out of trouble and just uh, learning how to DJ in my, my house, so. Definitely. You say your folks uh, immigrated from Cambodia? Yes. Tell, did they come to the area from, from Cambodia? And was this their first stop or did they land over here? Um, so they really, uh, you know, were Cambodian Chinese. So at the time in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a, uh, what they call the killing fields. 
when the killing fields were um, basically the Khmer Rouge, which is the Cambodian communists, uh, would kill anyone um, that wasn't full Cambodian or they had a suspicion that, you know, you were going against uh, what the Khmer Rouge police were. So um, they really call it Cambodian genocide. So my parents, I wasn't born at the time, but uh, my parents, along with my sister and my two brothers were in Cambodia. Uh, and it was just a, a real bad time for Cambodian people. Um, you know, they took my oldest brother to a concentration camp, uh, kids concentration camp really just came in, you know, and what they did was they took the young men that they knew they could physically get labor from. So they took my oldest brother, uh, my parents never saw him again, um, you know, and we lost communication with them. There really wasn't any communication from what my parents told me. They just came in, took my oldest brother and left. And that was the last time my parents saw my brother. And then while all this was going on, they took my family to like a, another concentration camp. And my other brother died from malnutrition uh, when he was like two years old. So from there, my parents, you know, with my sister, who was at the time might have been four or five, actually, she might have been like six, uh, they escaped to, um, it's kind of like in the mountains of Thailand, where they had refugee camps for families. So my parents were able to escape to this refugee camp. Um, and luckily, you know, uh, there used to be like an American sponsorship where you were sponsored by like a family in America that would bring uh, other families from Cambodia or Vietnam or wherever to America. So that's kind of how my family came to America. And then I was born in Greensboro. So, um, but yeah, that's how my family came here. And uh, I'm just real thankful that you know, my parents, uh, they never gave up and they were courageous and, and they made it to America uh, for me to have a better life. Definitely. I'm sorry to bring you through that painful history, but I think it's oh, no. important because it's one of the things that is not really taught in the American curriculum. I didn't find out about Khmer Rouge until I graduated and had some time to kind of do my own study of history, world history. My grandma is Vietnamese and my mom is Vietnamese. And um, they didn't have, you know, the genocide, but it was yeah. a very scary time for them in Vietnam. Yeah. When Saigon fell and, you know, they were in the South, they also had to stay at a camp in Thailand for a while until they could get sponsored by somebody in the U.S. And it's just these stories are important. These narratives are important. And it's just so wild that through DJing two children of immigrants who sacrificed everything, could come to a country where their kids can play with music. You know what I'm saying? And for you to make a career out of music, that's beautiful. You know, you yeah. you sustain your, you have a family that you've been able to provide for through music and through a creativity and through through a craft, through a hobby. And there's something beautiful in that. And it does need to be talked about more, I think, because these things are still going on. I think the current dictator of Cambodia was the right hand man to the someone who was high up in the Khmer Rouge at the time and people are struggling right now. So yeah, we'll, we'll get off of that, but thank you for sharing that with us. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Go ahead, you know, go I, ahead. I'd like to say, man, uh, you know, a lot of Asian parents in general, you know, they weren't, they're not too thrilled if their kids not going to school and, you know, making straight A's and, you know, turning out to be a doctor. I kind of got lucky, my sister, who was 10 years older than me, she took that burden off of me. She was the one who went to school. She was the one who, you know, uh, went to NC State on full scholarship. She didn't pay for, you know, any uh, of her college uh, tuition. It was all paid for through scholarship. So my sister took that burden off of me. Once my sister went to school, my parents really, you know, as long as they knew I wasn't in a gang or doing anything bad, then, I was okay, so I got real lucky being able to, you know, to pick up music and and go from there. So I, it's just a crazy time, like being in an Asian household and things like that. 
<laughs> I feel you because I'm the older brother in my family, and my little brother got it way easier than I do. Uh, but I'm I'm happy for you feel him. me. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm glad for it. Yeah, yeah. Um. So what were you listening to as a as a young kid in in the '80s and the ni- early '90s? Oh man, in uh, Greensboro. What? Well, of course, you know, just with my sister, uh, she was a huge Prince fan. Um, so I listened to a lot of Prince. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of pop music, Michael Jackson, and even at the time, you know, whether it was Stevie Wonder, uh, anything like that. Um, a little bit of jazz, of course. Uh, I was just super uh, into whatever, you know. Um, as far as hip hop, you know, uh, in my middle school days, you know, I was a real big Fuji's fan uh, at that time. Like Nas, it came out with I Am, so you know, I was a real big hip hop fan too. But um, you know, it was just listening to music. It wasn't like playing with records, so. Um, but a lot of that played a big influence on me, you know, playing hip hop music. So, you know, it, it really just set a tone for who I am as a DJ uh, and just trying to learn, uh, you know, as, as much as I can about music and the business of it, too. So. And when did you start taking the craft serious? What was it about DJing that really grabbed you and said, all right, this is the one? Uh, I mean, I can never really tell you, you know, when it's the one I, I could tell you, you know, I knew that it was something that I really enjoyed when four or five hours would pass by and I would just still be doing the same thing, you know, with the same records until the records would start to, you know, make uh, the vinyl cracking noise. So, um, but I always knew that uh, I wasn't going to be a person that's going to sit in the office all day. That just wasn't my life. You know, even graduating out of high school, you know, I knew I wasn't going to not, not per se make it through college. I was going through other family things. Um, but DJing has always been a part of me. So, uh, you know, I will say once I knew that school wasn't for me, I knew I had to do something else. So, you know, polishing my DJ career was something that uh, I kind of took seriously then. And when did you realize you could start getting paid for DJing? What was your first paid gig? Do you remember? My first paid gig? Yeah, I remember. It's probably senior year in high school. And I brought my two really crafty turntables and my beat up mixer and some house speakers like just some small you know little house boombox speakers and I did a friend's birthday party and I think I got paid like fifty dollars after DJing for like six hours (laughs) (laughs) bringing six crates of records having to set up the needles and not knowing really how to DJ a party I just knew These were party records and, you know, I needed to play some of these songs. And of course, at the time, you know, you didn't have a library. You didn't have a hard drive full of music or you didn't, you weren't able to access online. So whatever music you just had in crates, that's all you had. So, you know, it's, it's hard to make it through four and a half, five hours of DJing without playing the same vinyl. So, um, but yeah, it was definitely a good time. I definitely remember making like $50 and being excited that I made $50. <laughs> so, man, it was, it was definitely a good time. I bet. And today everything can be filmed, but that's just a capsule in time. Like, you can't really go back to that moment, but you have it in your memory, stored in your memory bank. And that's, I, got, that's I got one picture. I have one nice. picture. <laughs> one picture, and that's it. But uh, yeah. You know, and that had to be almost 21 years ago. For those of you watching today, you can come to the library, check out a DJ controller, hook it up to your laptop. And in about 10, 15 minutes, you have access to your whole iTunes, your whole MP3 music collection that you can play around with. The controller itself is about five pounds with the case. So it's not too big of a deal to carry around back and forth. But back in the day, just 
the barriers to entry in DJing were way higher. You had to figure out what kind of turntables you could use, build a vinyl collection, lug all the stuff around with you. It was just a lot different back in the day. Um, but luckily, you don't have to do with it. It's, there's a lot that can be learned from doing that. Um, but there's a lot that can be learned from using your controller as well. Once again, you can check those out at the library. Um, just come up to the Ask Us desk and take it home for a week. I like your plug. Way to plug that <laughs> in. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Way to plug that so, in. So let's fast forward a little bit. When did you really start like, all right, you can, I, I can call myself a DJ and I'm doing gigs regularly. I'm getting paid for my craft and I'm getting, I can see myself getting better weekly. Right. When did that, um, when did that hit? Uh, so of course, you know, everybody starts off at that time. You're starting off uh, just being a bedroom DJ and learning, you know, the, really the technicalities of DJing on turntables and a mixer and how to mix songs. Um, but of course, you know, you would meet other DJs at the record store, anything like that. And I, I met a couple of DJs that were older than me and they were huge. They were really big at that. I didn't know who they were, but I met them either through the record store or through another person but I knew that they were doing like clubs and parties and things like that. I was like, Oh, you know, that's, that's cool. Uh, at that time I might've been 18, 19. And I was really just wanted to know, you know, what a club was. So I would go with them, carry their records, watch them DJ. Uh, sometimes they would let me open up using their records or they would let me bring a crate of records and, you know, be the opening DJ really trying to learn how to set the mood, the mood and the tone of the party and really just kind of create a vibe. So when they got up to DJing to be the headliner DJ, you know, they didn't have to warm up. They could just go right into these songs. They could go right into these mixes. Or they could drop the song because they knew that was the mode. You know, it was already time for them to get ready to go. So just meeting other DJs and, and learning from them, uh, DJ Skills, DJ MC, who was a huge influence uh, for me. He did a lot of NC State tally parties at the time. Uh, and if you don't know about, you know, the NC State tally student center parties, they were huge. Uh, literally kid, teenagers, college students, adults <laughs> were showing up to NC State to party from everywhere, from Virginia, you know, all the way from, I would say, Greensboro, Charlotte, any, any college students that went to, you know, UNC, Duke, or HBCU school, they would show up to these NC State student tally parties and MC would just, you know, he was an incredible DJ. So I took a lot uh, of learning and tips from watching him and kind of just, you know, took it into my own skills. And from there, I just knew, okay, you know, what, what else is he doing? Is he, you know, passing out cards? Does he have flyers? You know, is this DJ doing mixtapes? Uh, is this DJ doing mixes on CDs or tapes? Really CDs at that point. But, um, and really just from there, it, it kind of took off. And I, you know, created my DJ name and then, you know, just started making my own mixes, started making my own tapes, uh, started making my own flyers. And of course, once you open up as a DJ, you would meet other people and they would hear you DJ. And then, you know, they might give you a chance to do a smaller event or a smaller party. So that's kind of how I got into it. From there, it just progressed. I love that traditional way of learning a craft by starting as an apprentice. In tattoos, you start off by cleaning the shop, you clean all the supplies, and then you work your way to eventually getting a chair. And it's, it sounds like, at least old school wise, it was similar in DJing, where you follow around a DJ, help him set up, lug all the equipment, take it back, and eventually you get your 15 minutes to warm up. It's a stand up. Same thing with like an open mic. Sure. You kind of just get your time on stage, get used to it. What were some of the little tricks? Of course, there's mixing. Of course, there's crowd control. Of course, there's scratching when it comes to DJing. But what were some of the little things you learned from your mentors that other people weren't doing that kind of set them apart? Uh, uh, probably the biggest thing is getting on the microphone. Um, you know, getting on the microphone helps you. First of all, it, uh, it helps you 
you know, get some sort of uh, attention from the crowd, not just, okay, you know, they're here to party, but also, you know, they could put the name with the face of who's DJing. So getting on the microphone was a huge influence. Of course, a lot of DJs, they struggle with public speaking and getting on the microphone. But, you know, I've seen DJs that they can't really DJ, but when they get on the microphone, they can, you know, motivate the crowd and, you know, whoever's at the show, they can make them do whatever they feel like doing just because they got on the microphone. So, you know, getting on the microphone is probably one of the biggest elements that it's like a hidden gem for DJs. I've seen DJs that have the most incredible talent, but they never get on the microphone. And once they hit a level of success, they can't go any further because they haven't added these elements to their DJing. So you know, getting on the microphone is probably the biggest, I would say, you know, a, a hidden thing that DJs should always learn, or musicians in general. That's an interesting one because that's not one you can really practice in your room. I mean, of course, you can get used to like the things you say to get people hyped, but that's one that you got to be in front of a crowd and learn what works and what doesn't and crowd control. And it's one of the things that I've seen, I've caught a couple of your sets before, and it's one thing that you are very good at. You can get a crowd excited, especially if they're at low energy, to get them out of their chairs and onto the dance floor is not an easy thing to do. Um, especially like you look different than I think a lot of your crowds, you know, you're oh, yeah. an Asian dude coming into a lot of parties where it's like college students or um, just a large black crowd and they, they dig it. Like they, they get excited as soon as you get on that microphone because of that skill that you've developed over time. Um, and you just kind of have to, you got to jump out there and do it. You know, there's no other way you can practice at home. I mean, even now I still practice and, and, and go through things I need to be saying uh, at home or, you know, trying to think of new ideas, you know, how to get the crowd involved or whether I'm at a show, you know, what I need to be doing to, to hype up the crowd before an artist walks up. So you can do all that, but you really just have to take that leap and know that, I mean, you're going to mess up. Like messing up is part of the deal. Like, you know, everybody messes up all the time, especially when it's live. But just understand when you mess up, that part that you've messed up on is already gone. So you can't get that back. There's no getting back. You know, all you can do is just you can go from there, pick it up. And then once it's over, you can reassess what you did wrong. But you really have to step out there, man, and, and, and take that leap of faith to know that, you know, it's kind of just like riding a bike. You just got to just keep doing it and, and you'll get better at it for sure. So public speaking, developing your skill, practicing. Um, what's another thing you can recommend, say to a student who's a DJ on the side and they're going to school, what's, say we're on normal times where things are rocking, what's one thing you can recommend to trying to get new gigs? Um, uh, the biggest thing is probably learning how to network. Uh, you know, um, networking is a, a huge thing, whether it's for new gigs or trying to build relationships with brands, uh, getting sponsorships, or other DJs that might have access to other gigs. And what I mean by building relationships, I just mean, you know, of course, there's always a reasoning behind it, but always be genuine with another person. Uh, you know, always talk to another person. It doesn't even have to be about music or the gig or anything like that. You know, just every day-to-day -day life, just learning how to talk to people and being thankful, being grateful, saying yes and, you know, please and thank you and showing appreciation uh, is um, one thing that I feel like everybody needs to, to have. You know, and another thing is it, didn't ma it doesn't matter what level you're at. If you're starting DJ level, headline club DJ level, you know, uh, elite DJ tour DJ, festival DJ, every time you go up a level, you're starting at the bottom of that level. So having humility, 
you know, and always just having the open mind to learn new things. Like I, you know, of course me being an old school OG DJ, you know, I didn't have that mentality 10 years ago. You know, I didn't want to cross over to Serato. I didn't want to learn on CDJs or I didn't want a, a controller, you know, but learning that oh, I, I need to open my mind up and learn these new things. So, you know, I can literally just round out my career so I can be a well-rounded DJ and just a well-rounded person. You know, I, I feel like that that's something every DJ needs to have at every level, knowing that you still got to learn. You know, it's a continuing education. Yeah, I think that's so important because when you when you love something so much like hip hop or DJing or rock or skateboarding or whatever you're into, it's easy to fall into this mind of I know everything about this and other people who kind of like it don't know anything like you kind of get an ego to yourself, especially once you have some skills. It can be easy to say, like, my, I know what I'm doing. This is the way I'm going to do it. But then you limit yourself. It's so limiting. And it it's, is. it's one thing that I had to learn as well when it comes, like you can, you can like pop music and you can like underground music. Right, there's, right. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There is, no, there's completely nothing wrong with that. I've had issues where, you know, I was like at the time, there were probably two or three DJs and we were literally at the top tier of doing every single HBCU party, CIAA alumni party. I was at the top tier. And at that time, you know, a new radio station had started up uh, in Raleigh area called Pulse 102.5. And it was a rhythmic station. So basically rhythmic means whatever was top 40 or hip hop that would cross over into a pop song, you know, they would play it. So they would play everything, you know, whether it was, uh, of course, you know, it was an EDM song or a Rihanna song that would cross over into a pop song. They would play it. And I landed a gig to be able to DJ there weekly. And a lot of people really thought like I had, what, what is, what is Dime doing? Why is he doing this? He's, you know, the biggest club DJ, you know, doing all these huge, you know, uh, alumni parties or, you know, uh, elite black parties or it didn't matter you know I was doing Red Bull gigs and they were like why is he you know doing these uh, local radio uh, open format station uh, and a lot of people were like oh you know he sold out but you know you're gonna get that at every level you're gonna get this type of judgment at every level even at the bottom of the level somebody's gonna judge you for what you chose to do so, you know, if you got it in your heart and you know you can do it, you know, just you got to put your foot, one foot in front of the other and, and keep going. Um, and, and that's always the belief that I've always had. We've uh, we've talked about CIAA a couple times. Uh, can you explain what that is to our viewers and what that energy is like during that weekend? And so maybe a story or two. From oh, yeah. Experience. Yeah. So it is um, a basketball tournament that is held, well, was held uh, in Raleigh uh, a decade ago, but then it moved to Charlotte. Um, and it's basically the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Um, and they would have basketball tournaments for all the HBCU schools that were pretty much on the East Coast. So, you know, Livingston College, Fayetteville State, a and uh, of course, uh, the schools in Florida, Shaw University, um, and all the way, you know, uh, Morgan State, Howard University. So all these schools, and they would have a basketball tournament. But, of course, you know, it would also gather all the alumni and university elite that could get together and, you know, really just reunite and, and have, you know, fest festivities and parties. And it kind of just grew from there. Um, and of course it got to the point where it was so big, you know, they would have parties that were hosted by, you know, mega superstars, you know, Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, 
I remember one year, you know, they had, it was literally every rapper that was at the time a top tier rapper. Uh, the only two I would say people that didn't show up that one year was Jay-Z and Beyonce. But at that time, Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj and Drake, you know, of course, you know, J. Cole, Wale, uh, Yo Gotti, just Future, just every single rapper would, you know, be paid to host these parties. And these parties would be, you know, huge, whether it was 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 people you know, uh, in uh, one building at one time. So, and they would have these massive, incredible day parties. And the day parties would be, you know, Thursday, Fridays during a regular day where people are still going to work, but you would look across the street and you would see people lined up at 11 a.m. to go to a day party and it would be wrapped around the building and it would literally have 200 people waiting outside to get into this day party at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. So, um, you know, and I, I was able to open up uh, for a DJ, uh, DJ Skills, one CIAA, and it wasn't needed to make it to another gig. So I was, I really needed to fill in for him for 15 minutes at, uh, just a exhibition like it was a uh, convention exhibition where they had of course like you know vendors and games and things like that so they just needed background music for 15 minutes and I was able to DJ that and a guy that was there that was one of the leaders of the head of the board for the CIAA heard me for those 15 minutes and he was doing parties on his own so I got booked to do a couple of his parties and then from there you know it just opened up so many doors as far as my DJ career uh, you know and I've done parties for to everybody <laughs> uh, hosted by uh, man let's see here future you know was probably you know one of the biggest uh, J. Cole a couple times for sure um, Yo Gotti, uh, so a couple times, just you know, just doing parties like that, uh, and really just doing parties that didn't have celebrities that were the most amazing parties. People, you know, pre social network area, uh, era where we didn't have Instagram or Snapchat, you know, people really just came to party, so you know, those were incredible parties. I did parties inside of the Bank of America building, three, 4,000 people just coming to party and have a good time. So you know, just incredible, incredible times of uh, club DJs. I I've had it. So super appreciative of that. That's awesome. I've been told that while I'm out here, I need to go check out Homecoming and CIAA just yeah. to really immerse myself in this area because they're huge, huge, huge events that go on every year. Um, and hopefully pretty soon we can get back out and start having some outside time again. I hope so, man. I really when, do. Were you, did you have a nine to five while you were doing a lot of these events? Was it a hundred percent DJing? And if so, if you did have a nine to five, when did you cross over to full-time DJ? Oh yeah. I had a nine to five pretty much, man, from 2002 to almost, you know, 2011. Uh, I was doing all types of uh, jobs. I was a, um, how, what was it? A production assistant up at, uh, at the NHL Canes Vision uh, where the Hurricanes play hockey um, at the RBC Center. I'm not sure what it's called now, but I was a production assistant, meaning I was running the soundboard uh, running the lighting and it was a it was an amazing opportunity it was a lot of pressure for sure just to hit one button at a certain time um, I'll give you a, a, a story that uh, I was actually on Sports Center on uh, ESPN um, for messing up so this was when the Canes had won the NHL Stanley Cup I think it was game three 
of the finals, or maybe game two, uh, the uh, NHL finals, and we were at home. And I'm not sure what I did. I might have not been paying I might or might not have been paying attention because the game was so exciting. We were up like four to one. And I hit the space bar and all the lights in the entire arena went down for like five minutes, man, five minutes. And, you know, my boss comes running in. He's cursing at me, yelling at me I'm like, I don't know what I did. I, I, you know what I'm saying? But what happened was, is I was leaning over the balcony looking and I sat down and I guess my leg hit the space bar and cut off the all the lights, all the floodlights that were up in the entire arena it went out. The only thing that were going were the digital ad boards that were going around. So the game had stopped for like five minutes. I made it on Sports Center. You know, it was it was, it was pretty funny. It was a definite learning lesson. But like I said, everything is live. So once it's over, it's over, you know, but that was a, a good job. And then I worked as a maintenance technician uh, at a college property about 10 minutes from NC State. Um, and I did that for about five or six years. Uh, and it was a, a great job. You know, I was working nine to five pretty much so I could still DJ on the weekends. Um, but that, that was a good, a good job too. You know, and those jobs, those type of jobs, of course, gave me some stability when, you know, I was having to try to put out, you know, a thousand mixtapes, you know, pressing up these mixtapes, it costed money at the time. And, you know, DJing was something I was doing, but it was good to have uh, another form of income for sure. And then after that, I started my company and, um, you know, working with Mez, uh, an artist named Mez, it kind of just took over and I quit my job and really, you know, I've been DJing full time uh, about 10 years. So tell me about starting your own company. How did that come about? So, you know, I got really big in doing clubs and alumni parties and, you know, just really anything that was uh, huge as far as getting a lot of young professionals together. I was doing these type of parties and, you know, a lot of, of course, when people go to party, you know, they're, of course, looking to hook up and, and, you know, meet the, you know, another person that they could start dating, of course. And from there, you know, I would get people that would meet at my gigs that eventually would start dating, get engaged and still want to have, they wanted to have that type of wedding that they had when they first met. So, you know, I got you know, uh, young professionals that, you know, were lawyers and whoever that went to NC State, that graduated from UNC, that wanted that type of party for their wedding. And I kind of fell into it that way. Um, and from there, I just kind of knew, you know, transitioning from doing the clubs, uh, that this was a good fit for me. I also, you know, I had two little girls. Uh, so when I had my first baby, my first daughter, um, I knew that I needed to, to kind of transition out of that. I didn't want to, you know, be, oh, my dad's going to the club and then my child knows what a club is. So it was time for me to get out. So, uh, that really helped out with pushing me into starting my own company. And what were some of the things you had to change from going from a club DJ and a party DJ and staying up late to then switching more to like weddings and events? What, um, what was different? Ah, uh, man. Uh, you know, learning, of course, the process of how, uh, whether it's a corporate gig or a wedding, you know, the process of how you should be in these type of settings, you know, of course, you got to be professional, you got to dress up, you know, your music has to be a little bit cleaner, and how you're saying and approaching uh, these type of clients and couples, you got to change a little bit. Um, and also, you know, I, I feel like this should go for everybody, you know, the, the, the more that you can check your ego, and, and leave your ego, you know, 
at the door, uh, the more you can help people out. And when you, you know, have good customer service or, you know, make people happy, that's when you will be able to grow as far as just not even your business, but just as a person, you know, you leave your ego behind and, and put someone else first. So those type of things really, you know, kind of grew my company and, and, and grew the culture of, you know, my business. Um, for everybody in the chat, what's your business called? Uh, my company's name is Cool Receptions. So, and we do a lot of weddings, high-end weddings, uh, corporate events, you know, anything that has to do with partying in a business or, you know, in a professional type manner, uh, that's what we do. We also do a lot of, you know, of course, private events, uh, branding parties, things like that. Um, but it's, you know, a lot less having to be out at the club uh, and getting home at 4 and 5 a.m. in the morning. So definitely. And the link is in the chat. DJ D Vicious says that he needs a discount for his wedding. Um, and B Man says he's wearing Jinko jeans for his wedding. <laughs> Uh, man, well, you know, I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, whoever's tuning in. Um, but yeah, you know, and now that my company is about eight years in, we have about eight or nine DJs on staff uh, that are just amazing, an amazing group of, you know, DJs that just have uh, this natural talent to DJ, but not only that, have grown uh, into their own as far as being able to to learn how to do other things with their music ability as far as music. Um, so I have eight or nine DJs and of course, you know, four or five technicians that run everything in the background that also are learning how to DJ too. So, you know, I just try to do as much as I can to help the culture of DJing and putting customer service first. Definitely. Shout out to Nate and Norm, who are NC State students, digital media students. They're always in the digital man. media lab and they've been, I know they do tech work for you as well. Oh man. Uh, yeah. S special shout out to Nate, Norm, uh, you know, and my other uh, young, uh, you know, guys at home, of course, Alex right here. And then, you know, my young high schoolers that are learning too. So I'm super appreciative of them. Danny, Matt, Nate, Norm, Alex, uh, Fred. So thank you guys for sure. Definitely. And so when you're starting your business, I assume you keep everything tight. This is your baby. You, you planted the seed and you nurtured it and it's growing now. How do you get to a point to where you're comfortable sharing that with somebody? So you have too many gigs that you can't DJ every single weekend, three events at the same time. You got to bring in other people and you got to trust them. So how does that process start? What do you look for in people that you're going to, you know, bring into the cool receptions family? Right. Um, and was that hard in the beginning? Uh, it's hard now. I mean, yeah. you know, let's talk about the first part. The first part you talk about is, is comfortable. I'm never comfortable. I feel like if you're comfortable, you'll never be able to grow, you know? And I try to, I try, even if I don't do it on purpose, uh, and things happen, you know, you, you have to learn how to, to do, how to deal with this uncomfortability. Uh, if you can learn how to deal with that, I, I feel like, you know, you're always growing. So um, with learning how to let go and, and let DJs do their own thing, um, of course, I have guys, you know, that come on and, and text that I, I take even they, they don't even do anything or, you know, they, they're really just watching the entire time um, and just training them on site. But, you know, these guys, even the DJs, they got to learn how to, you know, oh, if this is wrong or, or, you know, this needs to be fixed, you know, they got to learn how to do it on their own just so they can be comfortable too. Because in the end, I, I really want my guys within two to, you know, five years you know, if they want to go out and do their own thing, I want them to do that, you know, because, you know, that's the only way we're going to be able to push, you know, DJing culture and, and, and music in general to the next level is when people start to outgrow, but then they know they're outgrowing it. So they have to get uncomfortable and do other things. So 
you know, I'm all, I, I'm never comfortable. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, I'm comfortable when nobody has a gig on the weekends. <laughs> when everybody is off and I'm home and nobody, I don't have to worry about anybody, I'm comfortable. Now that is not happening anymore. And, you know, I just know I put a lot of faith in my guys to know that, you know, they're going to do a good job. Um, and if they don't, you know, that's where I step in and kind of just help them out. And even if I can't help them out, I do what I can for the bride or groom or the company to, you know, create that, that customer service to know that, you know, we're going to do what we can to correct it. So, um, but never get comfortable, never, ever get comfortable. <laughs> so never get comfortable never get comfortable man we have about 15 minutes left anybody who's viewing throw questions in the chat it's open up to questions um but other than that let me see so customer service you spoke on that how important is that in your line of work oh uh, man uh i think it's important to to everybody you know it doesn't matter what line of work you're in. You have to deal with people. The only way you're not having to deal with people is, uh, you know, you're you're doing something where you're totally just by yourself. But even then, you're still having to deal with people, you know. So being able to, to talk to people uh, and, you know, kind of meet them at a, a base where you guys have some sort of thing in common and you can build from there is a huge, uh, a huge thing. Like I, I really feel like that has more value in it than any type of skill. If you can learn how to talk to people and network and really build solid relationships where, you know, you're talking about other things or, you know, if you reach out to them, you know, they'll, they'll talk to you back or, you know, you create this type of conversation, you know, the skills will come. You know, whatever skill you have, you're always going to be working on it. But the main skill you need to have is just being a kind human being, man. You know, just knowing that, you know, whatever energy you're going to put out there is going to come back to you. So, you know, that's what I like to, to stress even in my own life. I, I try to stress that to myself. So, um, but yeah. You know. And your business revolves around getting people to come together to dance to make to move and be close and like create that energy um can you talk about how you had to pivot your business model during covid man 2020 uh, it was definitely crazy you know we had uh, somewhere up to 35 to 40 weddings moved so i had to you know reschedule so many weddings and events and corporate events and proms um, and really just the biggest thing that I learned was learning how to follow up. Um, following up uh, nine out of 10 times will get you the results that you want. It doesn't matter, you know, what your goal is. If you can follow up with people and Learn to understand that people also have their own lives going on outside of whatever you're trying to accomplish. So whether you're, you know, trying to get a new position in a job or trying to get, you know, into this field or trying to direct this movie or, you know, you need to work with this person, understand that they have a whole entire life going on. They could have children. They could be dealing with family, you know, so, I, you know, the other 12 hours that they have to put in, you know, outside of work, they could be doing other stuff. So don't take offense to somebody not responding back fast enough. Don't take, you know, offense to, you know, somebody following back up, but then, you know, they ghost you for a week. So always learning how to follow up. Well, you know, now might not be the right time, but, you know, you know, I have this, you know, this is the value that I can add to whatever you're doing, when is the right time for you? So, you know, if you have somebody's number, keep it and always, you know, make sure you learn how to follow up and keep a schedule of it, you know, follow up, or, you know, put it in your calendar. I need to follow up with this person on this day. So, 
you know, like I said, just don't take offense if, you know, uh, they got other stuff going on. So. Yeah, I know. I know I, I've gotten back to people with a follow up email just because it slipped through the cracks. We all get so many emails a day. Yeah, a lot sure. of the times they're for promotions and stuff. So a lot of things can get lost in, in the fold. And then also from me just following up with folks have created beautiful relationships that might not have never happened if I hadn't sent just, hey, just making sure that you saw this. Um, hope everything's going well with you on your end. Um, let me know. And that's all. That's uh, sometimes that's all it takes. That's and all it takes. That's really all it takes is learning how to follow up and, um, you know, what you what steps need to be taken to follow up. So, you know, I, I really it's a it's an education that, you know, I'm always learning uh, and learning how to deal with it in different situations. You know, you're going to have a person that's uh, man, you know, a Grammy award winning artist. How do you talk to this type of person? You know, how do you talk to a high schooler that you're trying to teach? You know, so you have to know, you know, how I need to be communicating with, you know, these type of people at every level. So, um, and I've just been, I've really had to say, I've been real fortunate to be in these type of situations where, you know, I've been, you know, uh, a big DJ and, you know, some, another artists, you know, or a local guy puts me on to, you know, a kid that's coming up and, you know, somehow I connect with whoever and I just build that relationship. So I just been real fortunate that way for sure. Definitely. And I've seen that during COVID, you've been developing your YouTube page. Um, YouTube page is below your name on the Twitch page right now. So people can go check you out. Please, yep. please. Link and subscribe, like and subscribe below. But talk about that process because um, I think before the pandemic, you didn't really have enough time to, to focus uh, on the media, the content aspect. But that's huge right, right now. That's the next step in, in this game. Right. So I'm going to be, you know, as transparent as possible. I probably could have done this five years ago. I just didn't take the leap. You know, a lot of times we're scared about what other people think and that's at every level. And that's with ego. You're scared about what someone else is going to think about what you're doing, you know, uh, what they're going to say or how they feel like you should be doing it. You shouldn't, you know, even at every level, you're going to have that type of ego or oh, well, what is this person going to think about? What are my followers or, you know, what I'm not going to get this many likes. You just got to do it. You got to put yourself out there and, and really, if you know, Hey, you know what? The more and more I keep doing this process, I'm going to keep continuing to learn what I need to chip away at and what I need to add to, to make a better product, to make a better, you know, this, this better uh, substance, this brand that I want to create and mold. But the only way that's going to happen is if you just keep doing it. So you know, I feel I have a great team, uh, Nate, Norm, Alex, all the techs, you know, they, they just believe in me and, you know, I believe in them and they believe in the brand. So you know, I feel real fortunate about that and just learning every step of the way. But, you know, uh, a dime's worth is what it's called. You know, I, I really just want to teach uh, DJs about not really DJing, but about the business of DJing, about the music business. You know, about how you can run your own, you know, uh, company, how you can be a CEO, how you can, you know, really put other DJs on while still being able to be yourself and not taking away from who you are and not, you know, spending so much time as far as DJing, but being able to do other stuff like spend time with your family. So you know, I, I just want to give those tips out and, you know, do some reviews here and there as far as what equipment we're using um, and things like that. So, you know, please, I definitely am appreciative of everybody subscribing. Thank you. Um, and liking the pages and, you know, uh, thank you for that. So check it out on YouTube. If you want to learn something, you know, and get some, uh, discounts, my hookup. So please check it out. What's, what's one tip you've learned with getting more people to your YouTube page? I think that's oh. something a lot of people are interested in right now. Uh, the biggest thing that I've learned um, is really taking your video 
uh, and not only just having it and putting it out there and seeing what happens, you know, because if you just put it out there, you and and you think that you know, five hundred people are supposed to just like this video in a sea of content on YouTube, that's not going to happen. What you need to do is you need to take your video and promote it on other platforms. So, you know, one of the biggest ways that I've been able to learn that I had no idea was as huge was Facebook groups. You know, going in and finding these Facebook groups that had niches for DJs that used a certain type of equipment or, you know, DJs that live uh, in this area, whether it's in South Africa or in Hawaii or, you know, that have Facebook groups and being able to post your content that you know is going to be relevant to them in these groups is going to get you, you know, more traction, more views, you know, and just get you the traffic that you want. So that's one of the biggest things that I've learned and not to let, you can't let off the gas. You got to just keep doing it and, you know, and the consistency is key. So, didn't a Facebook group invite you to do a live stream DJ in like Nigeria or something over during COVID? Or like <laughs> South? Uh, yes. So, um, you know, uh, I do a lot of, well, I was doing a lot of streaming online as far as DJing. Um, but, you know, there's some groups like the Diaspora group, which was like a huge, uh, community as far as, um, you know, African music, Nigerian music. And, you know, for me to be able to be a Cambodian DJ with, you know, uh, just a yellow face on the screen for, you know, I'm talking about 15,000 uh, members on a, you know, really a huge uh, African base you know, community on Facebook was huge. So, you know, I got the chance to be able to DJ for them and really just display my DJing skills uh, and, and, and playing, you know, all types of music. So uh, that was a good thing. And, and those type of things really do help as far as building your brand. Yeah, I think that's super cool. These days you can, you can build your local base, but you might have a base in Denver that just really likes you for some reason in their community. You're the DJ that they look to in Hawaii. And who knows if they invite you, you might be able to take a trip somewhere you might've never thought possible. Um, yeah. We're gonna wrap up. Anybody in the chat, if you have a question for Don, go ahead and throw it in there. My last question to you, Don, is what's next? What are your goals for 2021 and beyond? Oh man, 2021. Uh, you know, I work with the artist named Mez. Uh, Mez is a local, uh, well, not local anymore, but a local, was a local uh, rapper, artist, um, who actually has been doing some amazing things. And me and Mez uh, and a couple of other uh, guys um, that manage Mez have a record label, and the record label is called Ayers. So it's Ayers Entertainment, uh, and Mez, under the Ayers label, has directed... Uh, he directed J. Cole's Middle Child. Um, and, you know, as far as his music, uh, really just focused on what we need to do to bring his music to the light of, you know, uh, more fans. Um, I feel like he has incredible talent. Uh, his, his pin game, as far as creating, you know, music is, is amazing. So, you know, that's what's next up for 2021, uh, getting back to doing shows uh, and really just pushing airs as a label um, and Mez as a artist and, you know, a director. So um, he just finished up. Uh, he did some records for, uh, did some directing for our artists from TDE. So, of course, Top Dog, who is Kendrick Lamar's label. Uh, he did a bunch of videos for them that are coming out. So, you know, really just whenever it's time for him to put his music out, uh, I just want to be uh, the person to be able to, you know, get that creative outlet for him. So that's what's next for 2021. And of course, you know, doing everything I can for my own business and being the best father that I can be. Beautiful. 
So uh, B-Man is asking about your affiliation with MMG. <laughs> Man, B-Man is, he's a, he's a wild guy. So B-Man is one of uh, the DJs for the company. I don't have any affiliation with MMG, um, but, you know, I have affiliations with other, you know, other uh, things that go on uh, within, you know, local festivals and, you know, uh, even bigger things than that. So you know, I just, uh, no, nah, I don't have any affiliation with MMG. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's really what I'm looking forward to and, you know, building, of course, airs and cool receptions and, you know, uh, helping Dreamville, whatever, whatever help they need. Great. And we bring it back Dreamville Festival, right? Of course, of course, you know, once it's safe, you know, who knows when that's going to be uh, with, you know, everything that's going on with COVID. So, but I'm definitely looking forward to it and, you know, putting all the uh, local things together for Dreamville Festival. So uh, whether they're, you know, pop-up shops, hip hop groups, DJ lessons, uh, you know, things like that, I'm, I'm excited for. Lovely. All right. Thank you, Dom. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for taking time out of this beautiful day. We really appreciate having you. We're definitely going to bring you back for a workshop um, once we can get back into in-person teaching, test out some of our equipment at the libraries. Where can people follow you? Uh, of course, on Instagram at DJ Paradigm. Uh, you can follow my company at Cool Receptions with an S. Uh, on Instagram as well. You can follow me on YouTube at a dimes worth. That's a D I M E S worth. Um, and really just everything is online. If you just type in DJ paradigm, I'm pretty sure the only Asian face is going to show up for that name. So please check me out. You know, I'm super thankful and thank you guys for, for the time for sure. Great. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Peace. <laughs>